Hey everybody, welcome back for another YouTube recorded lecture. This time we're doing chapter 8, which is gases. We're almost there, y'all. We've got one more full chapter, and then we have a partial chapter, and that's it. A little bit scary, honestly, but I'm sure y'all are ready for some break, because it's been a while. So chapter 8 is gases. We're going to go over some properties of gases, talk about some gas laws, and how to do some calculations, and then we'll be on our merry way. So, especially in this pandemic season with COVID-19, um, learning about gases and how oxygen is used in hospitals and things like that, ventilators, very relevant. Um, unfortunate to, you know, have to have that experience, but certainly a very relevant one in today's um, craziness. We're going to start with going over properties of gases. The kinetic molecular theory summarizes all the things about gases, okay? A gas consists of small particles that move randomly with high velocities. That's something that we talked about in chapter 3 when we were talking about states of matter. Gases just move all around. They move. They're like toddlers that have just had birthday cake all over the place, bouncing off the walls. They have very small forces between molecules. They don't really attract each other. They don't really repel each other. They just kind of bounce off of each other. Gases occupy a much larger volume than the volume of just the molecules alone. If you think about water, you pour a cup of water. It's not like, oh, the water is expanding. No. But gases, they are everywhere. They move around so much. The particles move around so much. They take up a lot more space just because of all that motion, not because there's a lot of mass. They're in constant motion, and they're moving rapidly in straight lines. They're not moving in, you know, curves and things like that, okay? And with gases, we always use Kelvin temperature. And that Kelvin temperature is proportionate to the average kinetic energy that the molecules have. So the higher the temperature, the more average kinetic energy you're going to see for the gas molecules. We're going to talk about four properties of gases. Pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. This is a table that describes those properties. Just kind of a short summary. But we're going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. We'll start with volume. The volume of a gas is the same as the volume that the container, container occupies. So if you have a container that's five liters and you put some gas in there, the volume is going to be five liters. The gas is going to roam around in straight lines, move very rapidly, and hit the size of the container in that five liters. You take that five liters and you empty it into something that's 50 liters, the gas is going to take on that volume. The volume of a gas is usually measured in liters or milliliters. So just keep that in mind when we're doing calculations. And the volume of a gas will increase if you increase the temperature but keep the, con keep the pressure constant. And we'll get more into that kind of a thing when we talk about all the different gas laws. Now we'll talk about temperature. Like I said before, the temperature of a gas relates to the average kinetic energy that the gas molecules have. And we use the Kelvin temperature scale when we're doing anything with gases or gas laws. You will oftentimes see temperatures in degrees Celsius. But remember, I'm writing it backwards, y'all. That should be Kelvin. 
Here we go. For Kelvin, there's no degree sign. And you're just going to add 273 to whatever your temperature is in degrees Celsius. So that's just a reminder from chapter 2, I believe, on how to convert. And I'll remind you again when we start doing problems. But you definitely want to keep in mind, don't do any calculations for gases with any temperature scale other than Kelvin. When the temperature of a gas is decreased, the molecules have less energy, so they have fewer collisions. When you increase the temperature, they have more energy, so you're going to increase the amount of collisions that they have. Now we'll move on to pressure. Pressure is just a measure of the gas particle's collisions with the sides of its container. There are lots of different um, units that pressure can be measured in. There's millimeters of mercury or tor. They're the same thing. There's atmospheres, pascals, uh, PSI, which is pounds per square inch. Lots of different ways that we can talk about pressure. The gas particles in the air exert pressure on us, and that's called atmospheric pressure. Now, if you've ever watched the weather, which probably dates me because I don't think people really watch the weather anymore. You just look it up or it's on your phone already because there's a widget there, right? But back in my day, when I was a kid trying to figure out, you know, when can we go to the park or what should I put on for school because I don't know what the weather is supposed to be like. One of the readings that you'll see is a barometric reading. And those are taken by barometers. The barometer just measures the pressure exerted by all the gases in the atmosphere. And so you can detect changes in atmospheric pressure, which are related to storm systems and weather and all that sort of stuff. The way that a barometer works is you have mercury, which is a liquid, and the gases in the atmosphere are going to push down on the mercury that's in a little container here. And you can see this, uh, this little inverted tube. When the gases of the atmosphere push down, that causes the mercury to travel up the tube. When the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, the level of mercury is 760 millimeters. So that's where the millimeters of mercury comes from. It's literally, you can take a ruler or something and measure how many millimeters of mercury there are. So 760 millimeters of mercury is the same as one atmosphere, which is the same as 760 tor. The barometer was invented by someone named Evangelista Torricelli, so the tor is named after him. This 760 is an exact number, so when we get into doing calculations, know that you don't include the 760 when you're looking at sig figs. This is a table that contains all the different um, units for measuring pressure that we were talking about just a couple slides ago, their abbreviations, and then their unit equivalent to one atmosphere. These top three are exact. All the others are not. So keep that in mind again when it comes to doing calculations. We said that the atmospheric pressure is just the pressure that's exerted on us by all the gases in the atmosphere. As you increase in altitude, that atmospheric pressure decreases. At sea level, which is about where we are, if you are in North Carolina, um, aside from being in the mountains, of course, you're at about, the atmospheric pressure is about one atmosphere.
And that pressure changes with variations in weather, hence the barometer. Okay. On a sunny day, there's a slightly higher atmospheric pressure. On a rainy day, there's slightly lower. Let's do a sample problem for pressure conversion. You'll need to be able to do this with any of the units, and it's pretty much the same thing. Um, you just have to know what unit you have, what unit you're trying to get to, and how they are related. Here we have a gas exerting 0 0.280 atmospheres of pressure on its container. Express the pressure exerted by the gas in millimeters of mercury. You're going to get the, um, the conversions. You don't have to remember how many millimeters of mercury are in one atmosphere or anything like that. After you do it for a while, though, you might remember. So this is our equality. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. I'm still working with a bum pinky, y'all, so forgive me. My handwriting is not exactly the same. We need to come up with a conversion factor from our equality that's going to cancel out the atmospheres and leave us with millimeters of mercury. Let's put the one atmosphere on the bottom so that it cancels out the atmospheres on the top and put our millimeters of mercury at the top of our conversion factor. I always recommend doing your unit analysis just to make sure that you're on the right track. Even with something this simple, it's sometimes easy to flip your conversion factor because you're just, you know, maybe you just wrote it wrong. You had it right in your head, but you wrote it upside down. It happens. So always check yourself. When you do the math, you should get 213 millimeters of mercury. And that makes sense. We've got less than an atmosphere, so we should have less than 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's pressure conversions. We'll do more of those in class, but the idea is fairly simple. Now we're going to get into the gas laws. The first one we're going to talk about is pressure and volume. And the law that talks about these two um, characteristics of gases is Boyle's law. Boyle's law says the pressure of a gas is inversely related to the volume when temperature is constant. So if we have a pressure, so this would be a direct relationship, right? That's not what we have. What we actually have is an indirect relationship. And what that looks like is the opposite. That's also called inversely proportional. So when the volume is high, the pressure is low. When the pressure is high, the volume is low. If you increase the pressure, the volume will decrease. So those are all ways to talk about the same thing. For doing equations with Boyle's Law, we always talk about the initial state of the gas versus the new state. So when you see the subscript of 1, that's the initial pressure or volume or temperature or whatever. The 2 is the final state. 
So you have gas at this pressure and this volume, and then you change the pressure to something else. What's the volume? So that's why we have the initial or the one versus the final, the two. So let's think through Boyle's Law a little bit. Let's say we've got a cylinder that contains helium gas. We're going to keep the amount of gas and the temperature constant. If we change the pressure from what it is in this initial uh, cylinder and we decrease the pressure, what does that do to the volume? Well, we said that the volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So whatever happens to the pressure, the volume is the opposite. The pressure decreases, so that means the volume increases. That means that B is going to describe this situation because we have to have an increase. So that piston that's in the top is going to get pushed up. If the pressure increases, the volume does the opposite of that. The volume will decrease. So if we're starting here, we push down on that gas a little bit more, and the volume is decreased. But the pressure shoots up. This kind of logic is what you're going to need when you're even doing your calculations. It's so easy to just kind of punch numbers in and go on autopilot, but you should really think about what your answer should be. If you have an increase in pressure, then you should be expecting that the volume you calculate is going to be smaller than the initial volume that you start with. So those are some of the tips that I can give you when it comes to doing calculations. And I'll give you more as we do problems. Let's talk about Boyle's Law and breathing. So when you inhale, your lungs, your lungs expand. Duh, right? But that means that the pressure in the lungs decreases because when your lungs expand, the volume increases right? So with Boyle's Law, the volume is increasing. That means the pressure has to decrease. And the air flows towards the lower pressure in the lungs. When you exhale, the volume decreases. That means that the pressure in your lungs is going to increase and the air is going to flow from the high pressure of your lungs to the outside, so you're breathing out all the carbon dioxide and other things. Now let's try using Boyle's Law. Remember that when you're doing an example problem on your homework or you're doing an exam question, you're not gonna have a nice little title that tells you this is Boyle's Law. Some of your homework might say something like that, but there are a lot of problems that are just exercise number this or problem number that. That's not going to tell you anything. When you read these problems, you need to pull out the information and label and pressure, volume, temperature, and then line up which gas law you can use to solve for the unknown variable. In this problem, we're talking about Freon-12, which used to be used in refrigeration systems. Not anymore. What is the new volume? New volume? That's your V2, okay? Remember, the 2 subscript tells you that this is the final. It's what you're changing to. So that's a question mark. Of an 8-liter sample, 8 liters is a volume. So we've got an 8 liter sample of Freon gas initially at 550 millimeters of mercury. 
initially at tells you P1 and millimeters of mercury is a pressure. After its pressure is changed, P2, to 2200 millimeters of mercury. at constant temperature and moles. So these are all the variables that we have. And again, notice how I use the units and the wording of the problem to figure out V1, V2, P1, and P2. Since all we have is pressure and volume, the only thing we can use is Boyle's Law. As we add on more gas laws to choose from, it'll make more sense why I'm going through the trouble of identifying which gas law to use and writing out the equation. We're asked to find the new volume, so that's going to be V2. I like to circle the variable that I need to solve for, just so that it helps me stay focused. To isolate P2, V2, excuse me, you're going to divide by P2 on both sides. And I still wrote P2. Uh, it's one of them days, y'all. But bear with me, we're going to get through it. All right, now we've got our equation. The next thing we have to do is fill in the numbers. P1, and again, be careful here. Make sure that all of your units match. So our P1 and P2 are in the same units. We can't have millimeters of mercury and atmospheres in the same problem. So make sure that your pressures match, your volumes match, that kind of thing. So that's P1 over P2 times V1. And that's going to give us our V2. The units of V2 are going to be in liters. How do I know that? Because the millimeters of mercury cancel, and we're just left with liters here. When you do the math, you should get two liters. And again, we'll do practice on this in class to where you have to identify which gas law will be useful in solving the problem. And you won't have a handy little title to tell you which gas law to use. The next gas law is Charles's law. And this deals with temperature and volume. We talked about temperature and we said that the amount of av the average kinetic energy that a molecule has is directly related to the temperature in Kelvin. We can relate that temperature and the volume. Charles's law states that the Kelvin temperature is directly related to its volume. So what that looks like is this. If we have temperature on one axis, volume on the other, whatever happens to the temperature, same thing happens to the volume. You increase the temperature, you increase the volume. But that is only if the pressure and the moles of the gas are kept constant. So Charles's law
looks like that. So we're saying V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. I want to show you how to use Charles's law. So let's say that we're doing a problem and we have to solve for T2. We have all the information except T2. We have to figure it out. The first thing you want to do is cross multiply. It will make your life a lot easier. Then you get V1T2 is equal to V2T1. Now you can solve for T2 by getting rid of V1 and you see how I'm gathering my similar variables here so my volumes are here it makes it easier to see what unit you're gonna end up with so if my volumes are together I have volume divided by volume, then the unit I'm left with is going to be whatever the temperature is. So you need to be able to isolate a variable out of this Charles's law. Let's do a sample calculation. A balloon has a volume of 785 milliliters at 21 degrees Celsius. If the temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius, what is the new volume of the balloon at constant pressure in moles? Well, we have a balloon with a volume and a temperature. Those are our initial conditions. So V1 is equal to 785 milliliters. And T1 is equal to 21 degrees Celsius. If the temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius, what is the new volume? So V2, no idea. We're going to calculate that. T2, that's our new condition. The temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius. Now, before you start doing anything, before you even identify which gas law to use, Make sure that you convert the temperatures in Celsius to Kelvin. If you don't do it first, you might forget. And if you forget, you're going to get a very wrong answer. So convert to Kelvin. Remember, for Kelvin, you have to add 273. Now that we've got our temperatures in the right units, we can think about what gas law to use. All we have is volumes and temperatures. That's Charles's law. Now we need to do our cross multiplication. And then we can say, okay, what variable am I isolating? This time I'm trying to figure out V2. So I'm going to divide both sides by T1. Then we just plug in all of our variables being very careful to write in the correct units. We've got milliliters for our volume. T2 is 273 Kelvin. T1 is 294 Kelvin. So the math here is not tricky, but make sure you put T1 where T1 goes and T2 where T2 goes. If you flip it, then that's a different problem.
the Kelvin's going to cancel, we're going to be left with milliliters for our volume. And sometimes the problem will specify what units you need to report in. So if it asks for liters, we could do this still, but then we'd have to convert our answer to liters at the end. So be very careful when you're reading the problems to make sure you're answering the question appropriately. Let's take a look at what we think should happen here. We're starting with 294 Kelvin and then dropping it down. So if our temperature is decreasing, we expect our volume to decrease too. So this V2 should be less than V1. And when you do the math, it is. Again, make sure that you do those logic checks. Your calculator will always give you a number. Doesn't mean it's the right one. It's only up to you to do the reasoning and make sure that the answer makes sense. With the gas laws, it's very easy to do. If you understand the concept of the gas law, you have an idea of what to expect with your answer. Moving right along to the third gas law we'll talk about, which is Gay-Lussac's law. And that law deals with temperature and pressure. You'll notice Gay-Lussac's law looks suspiciously similar to Charles's law. That's because pressure and temperature have the same relationship as volume and temperature do. So that's a direct relationship. Whatever happens to the pressure, same thing happens to the temperature. Pressure increases, temperature increases. This is assuming that the volume and the amount of gas are constant. So always look for that in the problem too, because there are cases when that's not, that's not going to be what you have. Again, just to show you how to solve using one of these proportions, the first thing you want to do is cross multiply. So for those of you who are not great with math or math kind of intimidates you, don't let it. Just remember, there's always a process. And I try to show you that process. When you cross multiply, that's what you should get. Now we're ready to try to isolate P2. For that, we're going to divide both sides by T1. So that's how you would solve for a variable with Gay-Lussac's law, very similar to Charles's law. Now we'll try a sample problem. A gas has a pressure at two atmospheres at 18 degrees Celsius. What is the new pressure when the temperature is 62 degrees Celsius, constant volume in moles? Let's label everything. The first sentence tells us the initial conditions. We've got a P1 equal to two atmospheres. And our T1 is 18 degrees Celsius. The question is asking what is the new pressure? So that's something that we don't know, but we will calculate when the temperature is, that's telling us what our change is. So the new temperature is 62 degrees Celsius. So that's a pretty big jump. Like I said, before you do anything with a gas law, convert your temperature to Kelvin if it isn't already in Kelvin. If you do not do that, you will get the wrong answer.
now that we've got our temperature squared away, we can see what we have. We've got pressure and temperature, constant volume in moles. The only thing that can be is Gay-Lussac's law with pressures and temperatures. When we're doing problems in class, you will need to identify which gas law to use. So make sure that you're practicing that when you're doing your problems. When you cross multiply, this is what you get. And we're now looking to solve for P2, which we just did on the other page. We put in all the numbers. T2 T1 And now before I touch my calculator, I think about it. T1 is 291. T2 is 335. So we had a temperature increase. This means our pressure should be a little higher than where we started. When you do the math, you get 2.3 atmospheres. So that makes sense. We increased our temperature and the, the pressure also increased. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about vapor pressure and boiling point. And we talked about boiling points when we talked about the states of matter in Chapter 3. When a liquid has sufficient energy to break away from the surface, it becomes a vapor. So if you think about boiling a pot of water, once the water starts getting warm, you start to see the little wispies of vapor, okay? Those molecules on the surface got enough energy to break free and become a vapor. In an open container, all the liquid is eventually going to evaporate. So if you had a bowl of water and you just put it out on the table and left it there, no matter how full it was, eventually it's going to go dry. But if you had a closed container, all that vapor that's being created is trapped. And that vapor exerts a pressure on the walls, just like any other gas. And that pressure is called vapor pressure. Every liquid exerts its own vapor pressure at a given temperature. So if you had water at 30 degrees, I will say Fahrenheit, because I know that we kind of think about temperature and we know what it feels like. 30 degrees Fahrenheit is cold, okay? That's a little below freezing. There's still a vapor pressure there. Higher temperatures, say 60 degrees, there's a vapor pressure for that. So at each temperature, the vapor pressure is different. When the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure, then you get boiling. At higher altitudes, the atmospheric pressure is lower than one atmosphere. So that means that the boiling point of water is actually lower than 100 degrees Celsius. So if you've ever baked anything, there's usually in, you know, instructions for baking things at higher altitudes. That's because the pressure is different. So it affects your baked goods. In a closed container, like a pressure cooker, which everybody has like instant pots now, which are like multi cookers or multifunctional cookers that can do saute and slow cooking and all that other stuff and the pressure cooker, they work by having a pressure greater than atmospheric pressure. 
so water boils at a hotter temperature than 100 degrees Celsius. So it's going to cook your food a lot faster. One example I want to point out here, and this is kind of a an old looking autoclave, but autoclaves are used to sterilize equipment. They're used in like a research lab setting, but they're also used with a dentist office, um, a hospital to, you know, sterilize um, all kinds of tools for surgeries and things like that. They also use UV, but an autoclave uses temperatures that are really, really high. And they sterilize things by having really high temperatures and that water is like super scalding hot. So if you've ever autoclaved anything or if you plan on doing research, make sure you get trained to use it because when that autoclave opens, you can get burned really badly. So when you affect the, the pressure, if you lower the pressure, if you increase the pressure, you're changing the temperature of the gas. And in the case of an autoclave, you can increase that, that temperature a lot. And it can really affect, um, it can really do some damage to you. They're great tools for cleaning things, but be careful when you use them. So this is a learning check that I want you to try at home. We'll go over it in class, so I'm not gonna give you the answers to this in the PDF notes. But this is you being able to read and recognize the different gas laws and complete each sentence with either increases or decreases. This will help you make sure you understand how all the gas laws that we've talked about so far work. So give it a shot. We'll go over this in class live on Tuesday. We talked about three different gas laws. Now we're gonna cover the combined gas law, which takes all of those and makes one law. So all the relationships between pressure, volume, and temperature that we got from Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Gay-Lussac's law, we can combine those into one big old equation where the amount of gas doesn't change but everything else can. The combined gas law is this. And the table shows you the relationship between the combined gas law and the, um, the gas law that talks about pressure and temperature or, you know, pressure and volume. So it shows you that relationship. Let's try using it. A gas has a volume of 675 milliliters at 35 degrees Celsius and 646 millimeters of mercury pressure. Well, all of those things are our initial conditions. What is the volume of the gas at negative 95 degrees Celsius and pressure of 802 millimeters mercury and is constant? Well, that question gives us our final conditions and we know what we're looking for, a volume in milliliters. So let's write it all out. Our V1 is 675 milliliters. T1, 35 degrees Celsius. P1, 646 millimeters of mercury. V2, we don't know, but it needs to be in milliliters because that's what the question is asking for. T2, negative 95 degrees Celsius. And our P2, 802 
millimeters of mercury. So here we've got an increase in pressure and a decrease in temperature. So we can't really figure out which way it's going to go just by looking at it. But when you have pressure, temperature, and volume, and you're told that N is constant, that means you're going to use the combined gas law. Oops. The variable we're looking for is V2. So we're going to multiply by T2 on both sides. Then we need to divide by P2. I'm going to write that up here. Again, I like to group together the like variables. So I group my temperatures, I group my pressures, and that way it's very clear what my units are going to be at the end. Let's put in the numbers. Broke my own rule. I didn't convert to Kelvin first. Got so excited, but I remembered to do it. So 35 degrees Celsius when you add 273, you get 208. Don't be thrown off by this being a negative number. 273 plus a negative number means you're just subtracting this number. So 273 minus 95 gives you 178 Kelvin. We put T2 on top of T1, then we put P1 on top of P2, and then we're also multiplying by V1, which is 675 milliliters. When you do all that math, you should get a volume of 314 milliliters. Again, the math is not difficult, but you need to take your time and make sure that your units line up. Because what if one of these pressures was in atmospheres? You can't take millimeters of mercury and divide by atmospheres, you have to convert. So pay attention to units. Make sure that when you're putting in the numbers for the variables that you're putting T2 where T2 belongs and that your temperatures are in Kelvin. Now we're going to move to something that's kind of reminiscent of what we're doing in Chapter 7. We're going to relate volume and moles. We're going to talk about Avogadro's Law. Avogadro's law looks at the volume of a gas and the number of moles of a gas. The volume of a gas is directly related to the number of moles. That's if we keep temperature and pressure constant. So if you have one mole, you've got one liter. If you've got two moles, you've got two liters. But let's use that for real. Let's say you've got 0.75 mole of helium gas and it's occupying a volume of 1.5 liters. What volume will 1.2 moles of helium occupy at the same temperature and pressure? That is Avogadro's law.
we've got our initial conditions. We don't know what the new volume is going to be. That's what we're solving for. But we know that the volume needs to be in liters. Just like with all the others that are direct laws or direct relationships, we're going to cross multiply first. Now we can solve for V2. We just divide by N1. When we put in our numbers, V1 is 1.5 liters, N2 is 1.2 moles, and 1 is 0 0.75 mole. You should get C. And that makes sense, right? Because we're increasing the number of moles, so you should have an increase in the volume. So that automatically rules out A. But you still have to do the math to know whether or not it's B or C. Oftentimes, when you see problems for gas laws, it's going to mention something like STP, and that's standard temperature and pressure. When you have gases at STP, you can compare their volumes. STP just means that the temperature is 273 Kelvin, and you've got a pressure of one atmosphere. At those conditions, one mole of a gas occupies 22.4 liters. This is called molar volume. The equality is right here. So 22.4 liters is equal to one mole of gas. You can use that equality to write conversion factors, of course, which are right here. This little image just shows that no matter what the gas is, if you have one mole at STP, then you have the same volume. But notice the number of grams of gas are different. So the volume is the same. At STP, their temperature and pressure are the same. And they all have one mole. The only thing that's different is the number of grams because they're different gases. So let's do some calculations using molar volume. What is the volume occupied by 2.75 moles of nitrogen gas at STP? You see that at STP, you automatically know STP and volume means that you're going to be using molar volume. If we know that one mole is equal to 22.4 liters, we can write a conversion factor that will get rid of moles and get us to liters, which is a volume. We're going to put the one mole on the bottom, and that will cancel out the moles. The 22.4 liters will go at the top. When you do your multiplication, That's what you should get. Let's do another problem that's a little bit more difficult. 
What is the volume at STP of 4 grams of methane, which is CH4? This time we're given 4 grams. We can't really do anything with that in molar volume yet because, well, we don't have moles. We've got grams. But we can go from grams to moles. Don't forget your chapter 7. Grams to moles, we need to use a molar mass. The molar mass of methane There we have it. That's the carbon. That's the hydrogen. If you don't remember molar mass, go back to chapter 7. I'm not going to explain it here. We can set up our equation by taking the number of grams of methane gas and converting it to number of moles. We'll put moles at the top grams at the bottom. From there, we can write a conversion factor that will take us from moles of, meth of methane to liters. We want to cancel out those moles, so we put them on the bottom. The liters go on top. So now we see, okay, we're going to be left with liters. Now we can touch our calculator. So you should get A for that one. Don't forget Chapter 7. Everything that we talked about with moles, we can apply to Chapter 8 when we start doing calculations with moles and gases. So please, please, please. Hold on to it. We're going to add on another gas law. This is the ideal gas law. This time, we're including all the things, all the variables. Pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount, which is moles. So the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And I'm, I'm sure you're like, so R? We didn't talk about no R, Dr. Hefner. We're going to. The ideal gas law talks about how a gas would work in an ideal s situation, okay? Real gases operate a little bit differently, but the ideal gas law is a pretty close approximation. If you rearrange for R, which is a constant, and you substitute in the SP, STP conditions we talked about, where you've got 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere, and you've got one mole, which means that you know the volume is 22.4 liters, then you can get a relationship between all of these things. That's where the R comes from. So if you have liters and atmospheres, atmospheres is really the most important, then you're going to use this R value. Remember, we can have different units for pressure. If instead we use 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the same thing as one atmosphere, then we get a different R value because this time we've got millimeters of mercury. 
when you're working with problems, make sure that you choose the R value that has the correct pressure unit. As we're going through and solving some of these, I'll point that out. Dinitrogen oxide, N2O, it's laughing gas. What is the pressure in atmospheres of 0 0.350 mole of dinitrogen oxide at 22 degrees Celsius in a 5 liter container? The question's asking for the pressure in atmospheres. Clearly, we don't know it. And we only see one condition. Just, you know, these are the conditions of the gas. So notice I didn't write P1. I just wrote P. The number of moles is N. We have a temperature. 22 degrees Celsius, which we will need to convert. A volume of 5 liters. Anytime you see all four of these, know that you're using the ideal gas law. And if you're using the ideal gas law, you need to use an R value. The R value you use is governed by the units of your pressure. In this case, we're supposed to give our pressure in atmospheres. That is the R value that we have to use because it's got atmospheres in it. This is the ideal gas law, and we have to solve for P. That means you're dividing by V on both sides. Then you're substituting your variables. that R value is going to cancel out all the units we want to cancel out and just leave us with the pressure. Our T value, remember that you have to convert. When you do all the math, you should get 1.70 atmospheres. So that's just using the ideal gas law, no tricks, very straightforward. Remember in chapter seven, how we were doing calculations with chemical equations? Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. Gases are involved as reactants and products in lots of chemical reactions. So we can't just leave them out. Usually you're given pressure, volume, and temperature for these types of things. And we can use the ideal gas law to figure out the number of moles if we know the number of moles for one, you know, one of the other gases, and we have the equation, we can do the whole mole, mole factor thing. So again, don't forget chapter seven, because you need it. So here we go, buckle in. It's not that bad, I promise. Nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to produce ammonia. We've seen this quite a few times already. How many liters of ammonia can be produced at 0.93 atmosphere 
and 24 degrees Celsius from a 16 gram sample of nitrogen gas and an excess of hydrogen gas. Whew, I got tired just reading it. But don't worry, it's not going to be that bad. We have an equation here, and whenever you see an equation, that means you're probably going to have to use it. We've got a 16 gram sample of nitrogen gas. And we're supposed to somehow get to the number of liters of ammonia that we can make. Let's think about this. If we were doing grams of nitrogen to grams of ammonia, we'd know how to do that. You take the grams of nitrogen, convert it to moles, convert moles of nitrogen gas to moles of ammonia using a mole-mole factor, and then you use the molar mass of ammonia to figure out the number of grams. Instead of doing the grams, what if we just put it in ideal gas law instead? Then we could get liters. So here's the plan. We're going to start with our grams. Convert to moles. That's using the molar mass. We're going to take those moles and convert to moles of ammonia. That's the mole-mole factor that we're going to need. That's why we have an equation. The next step is to go from the moles of ammonia to liters of ammonia. We're going to have to break out a new equation and use the ideal gas law. So that's the plan. Here we go. The molar mass for nitrogen gas, we've calculated this before in Chapter 7. I'm not going to go through the details of how to calculate it. If you need a refresher, though, go back to Chapter 7. Starting with the grams of nitrogen gas we're going to use that molar mass that we just wrote down then we're going to write a mole mole factor we need to have a mole mole factor that tells us how much ammonia we make for however much nitrogen gas. The nitrogen gas needs to go on the bottom so we get rid of it. Since there's no coefficient there, you assume that it's a one in front of the nitrogen gas. So one mole of nitrogen gas goes in the bottom and two moles of ammonia goes in the top. Now we've got our number of moles of ammonia. So we stopped short of what we were doing with those mass to mass problems in chapter seven. We've got moles, which means we can now go to ideal gas law. We need a volume here because it asks how many liters so we're going to divide both sides by P. And we'll put in all those values from the problem. And I'll just lay them out here. Our temperature is in Celsius and we need to convert that.
the volume we don't know and n we just calculated let's go which r value are we going to use you have to use the one that's got atmospheres in it got all that divided by 0.93 atmospheres. When you do that, your calculator is going to tell you 29.8 or 9 something something something. We need two decimal places, so I just put it as 30 with a decimal point. But you could also write it in scientific notation. So there you go. We started with a mass and ended up with a volume. This is the final section of the chapter, partial pressures. Much easier than what we just did. So you can exhale a little bit. The partial pressure of a gas is the pressure that each gas in a mixture of gases would exert if it were alone in a container. So let's say you had a tank of gas that had helium and argon in it. The amount of pressure that the helium exerts on the container, if it was just by itself, that's the partial pressure of helium. Same thing goes for the argon. The argon alone would exert a certain pressure in a container. That's its partial pressure. The total pressure is the partial pressure of the helium plus the partial pressure of the argon. So Dalton's law of partial pressures indicates that the pressure depends on the total number of gas particles, not the type, the total number. And the total pressure is the sum of all the partial pressures of all the gases. So at STP, remember we just talked about that, a mole of a gas would exert 22.4 liters. If you had a mixture of gas that equaled one mole, it would still exert the same pressure as the pure gas. So if we had one mole of nitrogen gas, it would exert one atmosphere at STP. If you had a mixture of oxygen and helium, but it still equaled one mole, it would still be one atmosphere. So it's the number of gas molecules, not the type. The air that we breathe in is a mixture of gases. It's mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but there's a lot of other stuff too. And of course, with the industrialized nation that we live in, it's a whole lot more other stuff. The atmospheric pressure that we were talking about earlier in this chapter that exerts a pressure on us, it's the sum of all the partial pressures of the different gases in the air. And this table gives you the typical composition of air. So it gives you the partial pressures in millimeters of mercury and then the percentage of the pressure that's attributed to each gas. Let's do a sample problem. A scuba tank contains oxygen gas with a pressure of 0 0.450 atmospheres and helium at 855 millimeters of mercury. What is the total pressure 
in millimeters of mercury in the tank, assuming that volume and temperature are constant. So we've got two gases, oxygen and helium. And we're asked what is the total pressure in millimeters of mercury. Well, we know that the total pressure is going to be the sum of the pressure from the oxygen and the pressure from the helium. The pressure of the oxygen we're given in atmospheres. The pressure of the helium is given in millimeters of mercury. If we tried to just add those two together, it would be wrong, 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 wrong. We can't add atmospheres and millimeters of mercury. The question is also asking for millimeters of mercury as the answer. So that means those atmospheres must be converted. Remember from the very beginning of this chapter where we did pressure conversions. Here they come again. When you convert you should get something in the ballpark of 342 millimeters of mercury. Remember the atmospheres cancel out. Now we're ready to add. Remember with adding that we care about the number of places. And since they both have places from all the way to the ones, that means that we're done here. We have the correct number of sig figs. The key to this problem was right here with the conversion. Now we're going to link up partial pressures to the gases in our blood. When you breathe in and out, you're taking in gas and you're releasing gas. We need oxygen to survive. So you breathe in, you have oxygen, it oxygenates your blood. You release carbon dioxide from your blood and you breathe it out. In your tissues, you have that same exchange where the oxygen goes in and the carbon dioxide is released out into the blood. The blood releases it um, through your lungs, right? There's an exchange there. So the oxygen flows into the tissues because the partial pressure of oxygen is much higher in your blood than in your tissue. So it's going to flow from high to low. And there's so much carbon dioxide in your tissues, just from respiration and all the things, that that partial pressure is much higher in your tissues. And it's going to flow from there into the blood. So this gives you an idea of the partial pressures of oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas in your blood and in tissues. So when your blood is oxygenated, remember when you breathe in, there's an exchange there. And when you breathe out, there's an exchange as well. So you can see the comparison 
for why the oxygen and carbon dioxide flow the way that they do. This gives you an idea of the partial pressures of all the gases during breathing because remember air is much more than just oxygen. So we don't really retain much of the nitrogen gas. We do an, an exchange with the oxygen. So we keep some of that, but we expel a lot of it. There isn't as much carbon dioxide in the air that we breathe in, but we absolutely breathe a lot of it out. And we also breathe out water vapor. This is the concept map for chapter eight. If these help you, by all means, go for it. It will connect the different concepts that we talked about and help you put them into perspective. Now we have the reminders. Exam three, which is on chapters seven and eight, will be available on Wednesday, October 28th. So we're going to cover chapter eight in class the same week that you have the exam. Again, I apologize. With the condensed semester, it's really hard to not do it this way. Your Chapter 8 Master in Chemistry assignments are due on Sunday, November 1st. There's no chapter check in this week for Chapter 8. Focus your attention on studying for the exam and getting the Master in Chemistry done. Doing the homework for Master in Chemistry will help you study Chapter 8. I didn't want to give you a chapter check-in on top of that. So make sure that you get that Mastering Chemistry done. We're almost at the end of the semester. Each assignment counts. So make sure that you're getting those in. That's all I have for you. Until I see you in class, please stay safe.